So here's another old Montrealer. Lionel's a returning speaker. He was here for our first conference, Idea City, and at that time, I remember, Lionel, you spoke somewhat unhappily about the way in which expatriate Canadians are treated by local critics. Hasn't changed. Hasn't changed. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Tiger, Professor Tiger, Herr Dr. Professor Tiger's uh, fame and reputation rests on his interests and work in the gender issue area. Is that right? And uh, you can get a little sense of his work just by uh, perusing uh, some of the titles of uh, the books that he's written over the years. The first, the one that made his reputation, was called Men in Groups. And the most recent one that's giving him a tough time and attacking his reputation is called Men in Decline. The Decline of Males. The Decline of Males. <laughs> You see how far the decline has gone. <laughs> Thank you very much. I not only now have to be the last speaker interfering with your lunch, I have also to be the interference between you and the ice wine. <laughs> and so you can understand that I regard this as a rather grave challenge. I'm also, as uh, uh, Ignatyev said, I feel buck naked because what I love about coming here and speaking is I get to wear one of these tags which for the first time in my life allows me to feel that I actually work for the telephone company, for example, or a nuclear lab, but the sound engineer made me take it off because he said it would uh, create extraneous noise. So I can't have my 15 minutes of fame with my badge, or actually 20, and uh, I'll have to do without it. Part of the problem of speaking here is that it's rather like being a jazz musician and you're constantly playing riffs that come from the other performers, except you have to do it all by yourself. And so there was such a rich array of things this morning so far to talk about that I uh, had full confidence and clarity about what I was going to say, but as I listened to fellow speakers, I realized that life goes on and you have to respond to the themes of, of each. If I had one commentator that reached me, uh, in terms of my professional interest, it was uh, the discussion of roots. Yes, we have roots. I'm interested in human biology, human evolution. I got interested in gender, not because I was interested particularly in, in gender or sex, apart from the usual uh, hysteria that a young male has uh, on these issues. Uh, but. Uh, I, it so happens that sex or gender is the clearest exposition of human biology, and that, of course, was what Darwin understood when he figured out that how two individuals choose each other and produce an offspring, that's the formation of the, ne the next generation and hence the species. So my interest in, in sex and gender really is technical in that I want to try to find out about our roots. Because we are... The more we learn, the older we are. We're now uh, in the 1.8 million year range, maybe 2.2 million years. Every time we find a new bone, it puts us deeper back into evolutionary history. In our department, one of our colleagues, one of my colleagues found the oldest tool in Ethiopia, in the highlands, uh, a tool about 2.1 million years old that indicates that our ancestors were actually making something in order to make something or to do something. So we have roots indeed. And when uh, we heard from Mr. Budman about what we share as, as citizens, uh, we also, as members of our species, share something very deep as well, which was actually alluded to in, in Moses' rather eloquent uh, introduction to the booklet that we all are doomed to carry around for the next three days. Uh, with the sponge on it, I'm half expecting mine because of the sweat of anxiety to have burgeoned uh, already. And so if, if you see me with an unduly big sponge, it's not because... Because uh, I didn't know where the men's room was. It was simply because I... I uh, just kept my hand on the, on the uh, <laughs> program book. But, but these, these roots that we have and what we share are, in fact, the challenge of our species. And I find it actually a welp welcoming sign to be surrounded by these tokens of our failure, these military figures. 
And as I was listening to Arthur and the others who discussed the September 11th business, I thought back suddenly to my experience of that morning. I live in, in Manhattan, not that far away, maybe two miles, three miles away. And I had a phone call from a neighbor saying, did you see, did you see? And I said, what? He said, two planes have just hit the World Trade Center. It's on the television. I didn't turn on the television because I knew it was going to happen. My lack of confidence in the ability of human beings to police, police their own insane impulses involving death, destruction, ideological, religious assertion is not very high. And so, obviously, I didn't know it was going to happen then, but having flown over the World Trade Center countless times, I thought no medieval mayor would ever build a city with this much, much exposure. Life is too frail, people are too mean, things are too rotten, unpredictability is predictable. Since then, I've been actually involved, and I hadn't meant to talk about this greatly, and I'll come back to the gender issue uh, later, because finally people really want to talk about sex, but uh, <coughs> I've, I've been actually done work in the Pentagon uh, for about 15 or 20 years, because there are some people there who are really interested in human nature, because they know that's the weapon. I saw a, a TV interview by John Chancellor of NBC with I.I. Robbie, the nu uh, nuclear physicist who won a Nobel Prize. And Robbie was saying that when the Second World War started, he was already a hotshot scientist, he looked at what weapon he should try to work on to help the British, and he said, radar. It's got to be radar. And so he went to work on radar. The next day I had a meeting with a group of people that the Secretary of the Air Force had organized uh, to talk about what's going on in our world now. Interesting group, including Bernard Lewis. And I said, you know, there is an historical parallel because I.I. Rabi, when he faced a challenge, a military challenge, he turned to a piece of technology. Our challenge, our common challenge, is to a piece of behavior. And so to understand that behavior, we have to look at our roots. We have to understand that we evolved in small groups of a couple of hundred souls. We've been doing that for a million years, two million years. We had a series of ethics, how we organized, which seemed to work. When we got to agriculture, about 10,000 years ago, things changed. If you have two goats, then you have four, then you have eight, then you have 16, then you have a herd. If you have one ear of corn, uh, you have subsequently a farm. And that shift ethically caused, it appears, considerable consternation because our ethical systems that we use are those created by small farmers and shepherds. The Lord is my shepherd. Now what on earth does that mean to us? Nothing, unless we understand that it was the shift from the small scale community with no uh, large amounts of accumulated wealth, uh, small intimate interactions so you could sort of trust people that you knew, you knew their fathers, their cousins, their brothers, to agricultural and in uh, pastoral life, suddenly we had to create these religions, which we did. A couple of hundred years ago, we moved to industry. I uh, published a book on that called uh, Manufacture of Evil, Ethics, Evolution, and the Industrial System. I think it's out of print. Uh, but it might as well have been from its start, but uh, <laughs> it's not a a, actually an attractive title, I, I realize, uh, nor, nor an attractive subject, but uh, just, uh, just uh, in passing, the Globe and Mail had a, a, a piece of, uh, uh, about me which came out on Monday, uh, I gather with a wonderful picture, uh, mainly of my apartment, it appears, which everyone keeps talking about. Uh, I haven't seen the picture, I've seen the text, and I already sent a letter to the Globe complaining that, the, uh, that there were some mistakes in the piece, which there were. Mine was that I said that uh, because of affirmative action quotas in the athletic field, uh, women in uh, important uh, aquatic environments like um, uh, Michigan and uh, Minnesota, or rather Wisconsin, were being given scholarships to do rowing to compensate for the male scholarships and so on. I got the universities wrong. Had I been writing 
rather than talking about the subject, I would have referred to an article in the Wall Street Journal which described the fact that because of the need to fulfill federal obligations to have exact equality of men and women in athletic scholarships, universities have been running around trying to get women above five foot ten. If any of you are interested, uh, you can get a, uh, a guarantee that if you get uh, five foot ten and some steroids, you've got a scholarship right through university. <coughs> in any event, um, I started this because uh, the journalist was complaining about uh, the fact that uh, I said that I don't choose delightful subjects. As a sort of antidotal activity, I wrote a book in 1992 called The Pursuit of Pleasure, which actually is, I think, a good book, and it's about why we love pleasures. Wine, food, community, ideas, clothes, shoes, candy. We're not just pushed we're pulled, and it interested me as an anthropologist, what pulls us? Well, uh, to come back to the warfare issue just briefly, there is a, an enormous challenge, and so far nobody has mentioned what the source of the challenge is. In part, uh, Sandra Littleson is here, Madam Brain, uh, who tells me that uh, she, we were at McGill together. Uh, she tells me that um, there's now a little piece of the brain where you can identify where religious ideas or explanatory ideas occur in, in our brain. Well, I'm afraid that this is a very dangerous part of the brain. Nobody has mentioned frontally and candidly yet that so much of the tragedy that we face is created by people claiming some special allegiance to some special force they call God. Jihad means that you can kill people that don't believe as you believe because then life becomes better. As we heard from Spectre, uh, you've got to rid this part of the world of anybody that doesn't believe in this weird notion that there's a special connection you have with God. Well, I happen, as you may have gathered already, uh, not to be a particularly religious person, uh, because after I had my bar mitzvah, nothing happened, really. <laughs> uh, I'd expected some sort of apotheosis, and uh, yeah, I, I guess I got $200 of gifts, and. Uh, uh, my father actually, in, a, in an agony and an energy of, of economy, had a custom-made suit made for me, uh, $29, uh, made out of a material so metallic, I think it was subsequently used by NASA for the <laughs> astronauts. And not only that, just before I began my growth spurt, he hit upon the brilliant notion of buying three pair of pants. So uh, I had three pair of useless metallic pants, a couple of hundred dollars, and real disillusion because this bar mitzvah thing, on which I labored actually rather hard, uh, provided me no spiritual solace. And I've continued to get uh, hardly any from these established outfits. But our problem is now not technological, as I said, but human. And I think, and it's my prejudice because it's my job, that in order to understand our present and our future, we have to understand our past. There was an Irish uh, poet, I, can't, I don't know his name, who said, to the blind, everything is sudden. To the blind, everything is sudden. And we shouldn't allow things to be sudden. We should know where we come from so we can know where we are, so we can predict or at least anticipate where we might go and what it might mean. And that is what I see my job as. And I have to tell you, notwithstanding some of the comments made about the US government and the Pentagon, if I want to get systematic, serious, thoughtful reception of whatever ideas I may have, I am more likely to get a sensible, intelligent, skeptical reading of those ideas from people in the Pentagon uh, than in my university or virtually any other university that I can name. Because you know why? They have a metric. Their metric is, will people die or not, depending on our choices. It's real tough, real tough. And uh, those of us who are academics or who have other kinds of obligations to ourselves, our communities, we don't have that kind of metric. And as a consequence, Con uh, consequence, the thought of death, as I think Samuel Johnson said, the thought of somebody else's death, it's a paraphrase, concentrates the mind wonderfully. And the people that I've had the, what's the word, uh, ambiguous pleasure of working with, because it's no fun, uh, in, in the military establishment are in fact extremely systematic, thoughtful, and rigorous intellectually about what they want to do. You may not agree with what their plans are, 
I'm not suggesting that I approve of what they're doing or why they're doing it necessarily, though some things clearly uh, uh, one can support, others one cannot. But the fact is that the process by which these decisions are made are, uh, is, is neither casual, whimsical, uh, nor without respect to the profound, profoundest human consequence, which is death. Having said that, let me get on to the gender issue because it's something that seems to me uh, actually rather interesting in political terms. In my Decline of Males book, I have a little subsection uh, which I call uh, Male Original Sin. Virtually anything you can say about a male will make a good joke. <laughs> you just say, you know, a macho, he was just a macho pig, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and there are countless people running around the world uh, making statements about unevolved males or backward males or upper paleolithic guys or whatever, 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 uh, because the notion is that somehow males have become the prime movers of everything bad, and as a consequence, we have a whole series of retributive activities, some called affirmative action, other called, others called consciousness raising for them, not for us, and the, uh, the consequence has been, I think, some real shifts, important shifts in the lives of human beings. McGill. We went. Now, the enrollment at McGill is 52.7 female, 40, whatever the uh, other number is, female, a male, rather. Now, we know from every study that has ever been done on courtship and mating processes that, that females like to mate with males that are have more resources than they slightly because they not unwisely understand that they may ne need to take some time out in order to uh, reproduce. And so they look for some guy that can tide them over. <laughs> well, it, where, are, where are those women going to find the appropriate males if they're not at college? College women don't like to, not, to marry men who are not at coll college graduates. They don't like it. They don't know all the right cultural signals and it's not so dignified. You know, I'm speaking somewhat pejoratively here, but I don't mean to be personal, but it's true of just how it works. Mating is a very systematic thing and women are very careful normally about who they choose uh, to mate with. So now we're seeing one result of that. And what is one of the results? In the industrial world, a third of women have babies without having husbands. Because a lot of women are deciding, look, no point. This guy has not got a degree. He's not got a steady employable uh, position. Uh, he sits around watching TV. He, he is not a reliable figure in the process of life of me and maybe my child. And so you know what? I'll do it myself. And as a consequence, women have quite rightly said, we want the jobs. You're not giving us the goods and services that husbands used to provide. When Moses and I were at McGill, for example, the deal was, if you were okay, you graduated, and you managed to be reasonably presentable, somebody might accept you and you could marry them. <laughs> and then for the rest of your life, you would work and you would supply money to your wife and children. Your wife, who clearly has a college degree, she'd work for two or three years, and then she would migrate into the house, and that was the deal. That was the deal. It was a capital T, capital D. Uh, Guys didn't think it was an imposition to work, and women certainly didn't feel it was a deprivation to not work. We've now totally changed this around. Women who can't work feel that they're being somehow truncated, as indeed in part they are. Men are getting increasingly reluctant to actually do the commitment thing, and there were at, in the National Post today, it must be males are not committing day, uh, because there were at least three stories all about guys who are not shaping up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we're beginning to see then is a very strange pattern in which women are having babies themselves. Uh, we're not reproducing our populations. Without immigration, uh, we would not be able to sustain our, our uh, societies. And the Europeans are now facing this in a profound and rather tragic way, hence the concern about immigration, the uh, xenophobia, and so on has to do really with a 1.4 1, 1 birth rate, for example, in Italy. Uh, that is, every, uh, in, for a community to replace itself, you have to have 2.2 .2 or so f children per female. At 1.4, which is the current rate, you just decline in population, absent immigration. Well, let me 
I, I have a red light here telling me that I should wind down, which I'm very happy to do. Uh, but I want to, I want to simply leave you with the following notion. And Sandra Whittleson has said, every time you look in the brain, there are sex differences. Sex, sex differences in the cockpit, in the computer that runs the thing. There are sex differences everywhere. Somehow in our community, we've decided that there are no sex differences, really. And if there are, they're the result of oppression, uh, systematic deprivation. There's something wrong. And so we have a whole series of numerical uh, uh, calibrations to say, well, you must be prejudiced because there are not as many women going into uh, heavy-duty engineering as there are going into social work. Hence, you've got you to make a, an affirmative action kind of thing. I can understand the motivation for that. But I come back to the athletic point. The athletic system in the United States, as I made, uh, pointed out in the article, you have to have the same number of women in scholarships as you have in the, in the population, which is normally about 56% of the student body. So you have to have 56% of, uh, of your scholarships in uh, varsity sports, female. In women's colleges, however, Smith, Wellesley, about 15% of women are interested in varsity sports. If there were a male college, then the college would be in default, and there would be federal laws, that would, federal uh, rules that would be hostile to them. Now, I don't want to go on about this unduly, because all I want to su suggest is that out of an access and the formality of sentiment in favor of rectifying something uh, that was unfair before, we have created a new form of unfairness, which we have now so general, generally taken for granted that we fail to see that life is hard out there for the guys, too.